call to the uh, January 22nd work session of the Salt Lake City Council. Um, for the first, um, the first little bit, uh, we have three items that we're going to talk about before we um, spend uh, the brunt of our time across the hall uh, interviewing potential candidates for the District 4 vacancy. Um, so the first item, item on our agenda today is an amendment to the Salt Lake City Impact Fee Ordinance uh, to comply with state law. Uh, so Ben Ledke and uh, Melissa, you're here. So Ben, I'll turn the time over to, to you. The ordinance before the council is a housekeeping measure. The Utah legislature changed state code governing impact fees during the last two legislative sessions. When the changes became effective, the administration started operating under the new requirements, but this ordinance will make those changes reflected in city code as well. So the primary changes are the refund of an impact fee is now sent to the original payer, the original owner of the property. Previously, if the impact fee was refunded, it would go to the current property owner sometimes. That's no longer allowed. Another change is the city needs to place on a website in a conspicuous place refunds where the original owner at their last known address cannot be contacted so that there's a one year period where that individual can search the city's websites to see if the city is trying to find them for a refund and can then file the appeal to try and get the money back. If after that one year waiting period, no one submits a claim of those impact fees for refund, then the city gets to retain the balance of those impact fees and any impact fees retained in such a manner would not be subject to the six year spending deadline. The other major change is an extension of the challenge window when a developer can challenge how the city used the impact fees they paid. Previously, they could file a challenge from the date they paid the impact fees to seven years later, and that's now been extended an additional year. So they have eight years to file a challenge. So those are the major changes if the council has any additional questions. Sure, questions or comments? Seems pretty straightforward. Melissa, is there anything you wanted to, to add? I think Ben did a great job. All right. Okay. Well, that was quick. <laughs> um, so thank you both for uh, your time and the explanation. If there are um, you know, additional questions as we move forward on this, we'll be sure to let you know. So thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, Salt Lake Emergency Management Update uh, for 2019. Uh, Eric? How are you? Good. Sure, I might have my other cohorts come up and Yeah, absolutely. Some. So introduce, bring, bring and introduce anybody who you would like. The time's yours. All right, so I think it was another successful year for us. We really put in a lot of effort and a lot of hard hours on working with some of our projects that we've been continuing on. Um, John Flint has continued with CERT. He's trained about another 250 people in, in CERT in both Spanish and English in a lot of those areas. That brings us up to a total of 3,500 people in the city that we know of that have taken CERT. Now, some of those people might have you know, taken it a while back, but that's quite a big contingent of, of trained CERT volunteers that we have. John has also been working with a lot of our volunteers and getting together a, a kind of a volunteer plan for disasters and getting um, phone numbers for us in case we do have a disaster to make sure we can call on our volunteers and they can be here to help us out in a quick and timely fashion. Fix the Bricks is another program that kind of now is, is out of the infancy and now it is a full program. It's actually working. We've completed 35 houses total from start to finish. We got another 200 houses that are now in the process of right now. So as soon as they take the money, they have, they have one year to complete the Fix the Bricks program. So we're really going to mo start moving with this program every year about 200 people on every single year. So hopefully we can start getting a lot of these unreinforced masonry buildings taken care of. And again, this is not, this is not protecting people from you know, economic loss to their house, but just so it won't collapse on them. And it's a FEMA funded project along with us. They, um, FEMA will pay 75% and we pay 25% or the, the customers or the homeowners pay 25%. So this is really a good program that's kept, on, that's kept going. We hope this is a 30 year program. Of course, we wanna get all of our unreinforced masonry buildings taken care of but um, it, it's, it's a little of a, it's gonna be a big chunk. 
So tell us the split on that again. So 75% comes from FEMA. And 25%, well, it's actually 25 to 30% because we were eating some engineering costs. About 25 to 30% comes from the homeowner. Okay. You know, and on, on average, that, that comes out just depending upon how much, how big your house is and everything. It's, it's anywhere from a couple thousand to 7,000 for the homeowner. Yeah. We tried to do this program. Um, we wanted to do it with um, businesses because we do have a lot of under enforcement businesses, especially a lot of these apartment complexes. But it just became with these apartment complexes, it's just too big of a, uh, of, of, of a cost. A lot of the owners really can't take the 25% cost a lot of times because when we're talking about $2 million to, to retrofit a roof, that's a lot for those um, customers. We're going to still try to look for more funding to help that out. but. That's just something that we'll hopefully look forward in the future. And we've also, um, we also conducted an exercise. Before, before you move yes, forward, uh, Councilmember Mendenhall has yes, a question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Eric, on the um, business potential, do they all, so they also have a 7525 access? Yes, ma'am. And it makes me think not only of multifamily housing, but how in a disaster, being able to get to a grocery store or the kind of businesses that supply day-to-day -day needs could be really important. Does that mean that we could work with food chains like Kroger or other well, we'd have to look big at that. businesses? Yeah, we have to look at that. Like Walmart does have, Walmart has an EOC in Bentonville, Arkansas, that all we have to do is make a phone call and usually they'll, they'll help us out and they'll do stuff. Kroger, um, I'm not quite sure. Walmart's usually the big one that kind of helps out. But um, we'd have to look to see if those buildings would qualify. I'll tell you the coffee garden in my neighborhood <laughs> is really important to the quality <laughs> of life of people. <laughs> if we could just make sure the coffee shops don't go down in an earthquake also. We'll do our best. Yeah, yes. thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, other, other comments, questions? Okay, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, so we did conduct a full-scale exercise or a functional exercise. We had public utilities, police department, fire department, public services, IMS, and community neighborhood in our EOCs for the exercise. It was an eight-hour exercise over two shifts. We also conduct, We also did data casting with the Salt Palace, um, City Creek, and Vivint, which the data cast technology allows mm -hmm. us to have instant access to their cameras. So now we can pull up on certain laptops that we have, and we can, if there's any kind of active shoot or any kind of incident, where we can instantly pull up, they can act, give us access, and we can look at all their cameras from straight from our EOC or from our dispatch center. So that gives us a big ground up. All of this was free, paid for by Homeland Security to set us all up. It's a program we need to keep on moving with. But um, we would have to buy just the, some of the stuff. But we did get um, the university um, locked in. We got Salt Palace, Vivint, um, City Creek. We're working on the LDS Conference Center, which we have um, enough um, we, we have enough of the um, equipment to really install all those. So. We're working on that. Um, we found some issues in our EOC from the exercise, which we always do, which we're currently waiting for a new director right now before we make some of those um, some of those recommendations on what we want to change, which some of them are just kind of minutial details in the EOC. So we will be conducting an earthquake exercise for this year because we alternate. We don't want to kill people with earthquake every year because it's just kind of unmanageable. But this year we'll be conducting an earthquake exercise which we will have those individuals. We've talked with the fire department and we've talked with police department about setting up a branch location based upon our earthquake plan. Our earthquake plan divides the city up into five branches um, because we can't manage everything all at once and then those branches will report up. But we want to test one of those branches with police, fire, public utilities, public services in one of those environments and see how that information and see how that work process works with us. Do you have a map? Uh, not right now, but I mean, could you get us a map of what those five uh, yes. sections of the city? Yes. Yes, I can. Like, okay. yep. I will send that out to you. It's all in our earthquake plan. Um, our earthquake plan is getting rewritten right now. You guys will probably see in the next few months, hopefully, an updated copy of our EOP, Emergency Operations Plan. It's due for review, and we'll need the City Council. We want the City Council to approve it, and we want to put it up on our website so the public can view it. Um, that's just something that we'll be working on. We've been working on that um, the majority of the year, and we're hopefully going to finalize that and get that over to you guys. Um, so that way everybody kind of knows what, what everything is. I, I understand the plans are fluid sometimes, but we just want to kind of a base play to kind of go off of in case of a disaster. Okay. Then I also wanted to make sure, but last but not least, I also got to um, Kenja, who does our multicultural outreach. She continues really 
we, we've wanted a JIC in our EOC for, for a long time. In the years past, we oh, kind of... Can you tell everyone what a yeah, JIC is? it's a Joint Information Center, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's where all the, all the public information officers come in and then they help out in a disaster, so they're all pushing out the same type of information, and then everybody's helping out with each other. This was really the first year where we kind of exercised it, that we kind of, we, we, we have a JIC now. We have, a, we, have, we have a staff, we have plenty of people in there, people know what they're doing. We gotta continue training and continue moving on that, but we actually have a JIC now, which is kinda, um, we're, we're far ahead of a lot of the other jurisdictions and our staffing and how many people, so that, that's really a, it's really a huge accomplishment for Kenja. We have also, um, she's also continuing her work with the American Chamber of Commerce, the LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce, and the Utah Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and the Asian Chamber of Commerce. She goes to all those meetings and helps out. She's continued to monitor all our social media, and it's been, it's really been a fantastic year for us. Great. Other questions? Thank, thank you for explaining what a JIC was. When, yeah, no problem. When I heard that everyone I, I, I wanted a JIC and I didn't even know what one was, yeah, yeah. I felt kind of out of the loop. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Throw something, I speak in Femanese, so throw something at me, sorry. <laughs> So, yep. uh -huh. one, uh, one other thing, and I know that this isn't, you know, directly related to, to you, but it kind of is, and you talked about it a little bit when you were talking about some of the coordination that you're doing with the University of Utah and other organizations. Um, have, uh, are, you, are you working together with them on joint outreach um, for specific, um, crime activities, so for example, when there was the, the shooting uh, up on the university campus, um, one of the things that I heard from constituents is the, you know, if you were on campus, the university police did a pretty good job notifying um, residents of something taking place. If you were across the street in the, you know, in the city, outside of the university campus, residents had no idea what was going on. Is there a have you talked about through this process that when there is a major incident um, at the University of Utah that uh, surrounding neighborhoods would also be uh, included or is there a way that yeah, that the, the, could happen? The, the, there is ways that that can happen. I mean, we, we do have um, IPAWS. Um, I don't know the acronym off the top of my head. Kenja, you know the acronym off the top? So, so we do have IPAWS that we can send out to all those um, individuals in that area, okay. as long as we get notified um, that that needs to happen. Um, we're also working with the U to kind of sync up our EOC so we're a little bit better on communicating back and forth. Um, it's just, just so we know we don't miss anything. Okay, yeah. so one of the things that I started working when I started to work uh, the emergency management is social media. They didn't have any uh, platform and I created that. So we've been working to connect not only the general market but minorities and that's one of the things that I've been doing one-on-one, uh, -on -one, meaning meeting with them personally and also with different associations like the Utah Pride. Uh, when the University of Utah happened, uh, we did um, get together and trying to see if we can start having an IPO system. Just because FEMA has a very strict regulations when that IPOS can go ahead and be sent. Uh, but we're definitely sitting uh, and working to see how we can go ahead and notify the rest of the residents. The only thing that we're doing are, right now is Twitter and Facebook and definitely we have a lot of backup uh, from fire and PD and uh, the rest of the public. Um, safety departments, but yes, we're definitely working on that because we did realize we need to make sure all the residents in that area were going to be um, right. notified. Uh, the other thing that we're also working on, we're also buying an, an employee emergency notification system. Um, we've, we've looked at a few, we're in the process of looking at to see, you know, all our procurement rules were followed, but it was approved in our budget that we would be buying a notification system. One of the notification systems that we were looking at does link up with, uh, with the universities and it would be a seamless transition if we set that up, but it's just depending upon if that's one of the ones that we're able to select once we figure it out. Okay, Eric, I think one of your team members had something they wanted yes. to no, add. No, I just want to say, IPOS is integrated public. Show off, show <laughs> off, okay, so, <laughs> show off, yes. <laughs> say it for the mic, so what was it? Integrated public alert and warning system. Okay. There we go. Okay. It's not as cool as a jig, but no, it's not but. as cool as a jig. <laughs> mm -mm. Okay. Yes. <laughs> other uh, other comments, questions. Okay. No questions. Hey, thank you so much. Thank really you. Really appreciate that. And, okay. and if you can send that uh, that link over, that'd be. Yeah, do great. you want me to send it over to all of you guys, or do you want me to send it over yeah. to? Okay. Yep. We'll do. Thank all you guys. Right. Thank you. It. 
Uh, so item number three on our agenda is a board appointment to our citizen, uh, Citizens Compensation Advisory Committee, uh, Raymond Shelby. This is Raymond here. So we are, I don't think he's here yet. So we can, let's do this. Let's take a break until three, well, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So I'm thinking we just take a break right now. Um, reconvene across the hall for the uh, candidate interviews. Uh, the first thing that we can do when we come back is interview Ray. Does that work? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you come back here? Uh, no, no. When we, we interview him across the hall as well. Uh, and then we'll just go directly into the uh, District 4 interviews. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay, Yay. thank you. I want to take care of. Uh, from earlier, it is uh, item number three on our agenda, which is the board appointment uh, for the Citizens Compensation Advisory Committee. Uh, Raymond Shelby, Shel how do you pronounce your last name, Raymond? Shelby, Shelby. okay. <laughs> so, uh, Raymond, if you could just tell us uh, a little bit about why you're interested in serving on the CCAC, uh, that would be great. Great. Any uh, questions from the council uh, for uh, Mr. Shelby? Yeah. Uh, thank you for being willing to serve. This is one of the, uh, I think, one of the most critical commissions that we have at the city. And uh, as the city is really the only entity in the state that really works with labor unions um, as directly as we do, sometimes this body asks the CCAC to do some pretty cutting edge evaluations so that we can take those kind of considerations into our budget making process. So I appreciate your background in the public safety realm. I think it'll really be important um, in the future. And I'm glad to see that role continuously fulfilled in some, by someone. Um, and we appreciate your willingness and your experience and background to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mendenhall. I would agree, um, you know, the CCAC has become a much more significant um, player in the compensation of our public employees uh, over the past few years. Um, you know, we've felt that it's, it's, as a council, felt that it's important that, uh, that the committee not only look at, um, you know, what, what other cities are doing in terms of, of just their regular benefits, but you know, as the capital city, what, the cha what challenges we have, what uh, issues you know, our public employees are facing, uh, your experience uh, definitely will uh, help uh, further that discussion. So thank you very much for your willingness to, uh, to serve. Uh, you don't have to uh, stick around for our formal meeting tonight. Uh, we will put uh, your uh, name on the consent agenda of our meeting, uh, and we'll take care of it there. So thank you very much for, uh, for your willingness. Thank you. Okay, so we're now at the point where uh, we will interview uh, some of, uh, well, all of the applicants uh, who are still uh, in the running for the District 4 uh, council member position. Uh, there are a couple of things that, that we've talked about since our last meeting. First of all, uh, thank you all uh, for putting your names forward uh, and for being here. Thank you also for uh, following the submission uh, requirements that, that we had as far as the uh, written questions go. Uh, I know from talking with uh, all of my colleagues uh, that we spent uh, time over the weekend uh, poring over your uh, information. I pre really do appreciate the detail uh, 
um, that uh, you you went to. Uh, that is is something that's going to be very critical. This is the first time in, in 20 plus years that, uh, that the city council has had to uh, appoint a council member. Um, so we take this, uh, we as, as, as the current council take this very seriously. Uh, we really appreciate uh, all of your willingness to, uh, to go through this process with us. Um, last meeting we also talked about uh, how things were going to go today. So the first thing that we're going to do is, is we'll, we'll be having all of you uh, have a chance to speak to us. Uh, there is a five minute uh, time period uh, that you will have. Uh, Cindy Gus Jensen, who's our council uh, executive director, uh, will be holding up uh, three sheets of paper. The first is a yellow sheet. Uh, no, the first is a green sheet. The green sheet indicates that, uh, that you are going and have time. The yellow sheet, <laughs> the yellow sheet means that uh, you have one minute remaining. Uh, Cindy will hold that up uh, for the duration of that minute uh, so that it will be a reminder. Uh, at the five minute mark, she will hold the red up. Um, we are going to be very strict on time uh, just because of the number of applicants that we have. Uh, if uh, if you, your comments continue, uh, the microphone will be muted. Um, so uh, we, we, I'm just warning everybody uh, at the outset so that it's not a surprise, uh, but just keep your comments uh, concise. Um, once we hear from all of you, uh, the council will then take a break um, where uh, we will think about you know the com all the, the comments that you've said, the words that you've uh, shared with us, uh, and then we will reconvene, uh, depending on the time, uh, either at about 6.30, uh, we, will, we will reconvene the work session again, um, where the, our, our, basically we will go through all of your names and sort uh, uh, the candidates into a, a group of up to four uh, remaining uh, candidates. And so that sorting process uh, will be done publicly at uh, 6.30 or uh, as soon as, as the council is done with, uh, with our, our dinner break. Uh, but it will be done before the formal uh, meeting which has been uh, noticed and agenda for seven o'clock. Um, so the one, we do need to have a quick straw poll about, uh, I know that you know, many of, so I've met with many of you, um, I think all of us have, have, have been meeting with, with most of you. Uh, one of the things that came up today in our chair vice chair meeting was um, you know, how to handle uh, any appointment um, queries uh, from this point forward. Um, so my feeling is that, you know, now that you know now that we've had the time to hear from each of you, uh, individually, we're going to go through the, the, the public, um, your public comments uh, and, and interviews with us today. Uh, and so the recommendation would be that um, from this point forward that we as a council don't entertain uh, separate meetings uh, with applicants um, because we, you know, the process has moved uh, forward enough. Uh, but before we, we do that, I, did, I do want to straw poll because that is uh, something that we have not uh, discussed up to this point. Um, does anyone have any comment about uh, about adding that to the or that requirement or restriction to the process? Mr. Chair. Yeah, Council Member so Fowler. The idea is that four people would be moving forward from here if up, there's not a up to four up to four people, yeah. correct? So it would potentially just be meeting with those up to four people, yeah. right? I, I'm, I need to think about this for a second. Okay. Well, think quickly. Um, <laughs> you did just so bring this. I on did. Us. I did. I did. You're right. Um, other. So think while I, I go to other questions or comments. Councilmember Johnston. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think one of the questions that could have to answer is what our process would be going forward at the four. If we have four um, who move on to a next round, what would that round entail? Because if there are specific questions that members of the council would like to ask and we can't do it in one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, we'd need a form to do that at some point in the next week. 
Okay. Um, so, you know, as far as uh, the discussions that, that, you know, that we've all had about what the process would look like next week, um, so we've, we've reserved the right uh, to make the appointment tonight, depending on what, uh, what that sorting process looks like. If there is, if, if one of you, uh, you know, makes it, you know, far enough to the point where it looks like, you know, it's, it's overwhelming, um, we do, enter, you know, we will entertain that, um, that right to uh, name that person and appoint the, uh, appoint the uh, representative tonight. Um, but um, that is probably not going to happen because um, what we said is that during our sorting process, uh, we will have a list of up to four, no more than four. Uh, it would be the, the, um, those receiving the top uh, number of of interest from the council through the sorting. So next week uh, we will have, you know, another, there, there will be time agenda during the work session to have follow-up questions uh, for those uh, up to four individuals if we end up not making the decision tonight. So there will still be an opportunity uh, next week to have more of the specific back and forth uh, with, uh, with the up to four candidates. But Mr. Chair. Yeah, Sorry. Council Sorry. Member Fowler, then Council Member Mendenhall. I, I thought, however, that we had discussed last week that there wouldn't be necessarily a back and forth with those questions, but rather we would have set questions that each candidate may or may not answer based on whether they pulled that out of a hat. And so and I guess you, part of... You are of correct. I, I misspoke. So it, it's, not, it's not the back and forth, but just the, uh, that, that question uh, opportunity. I, I guess my one concern, I'm sort of on the fence on this, okay. and so, but my, my concern is that if somebody, I, I have met with several people, um, but I haven't met with everybody, and I, if it's somebody that I haven't met with, I, I feel like I kind of would like that opportunity um, before we then have to vote. That being said, like I said, I'm kind of on the fence on this one, okay. but that's that's my general concern. Okay, Councilmember Mendenhall. Yeah, I. I think I want to have a little more clarity around how we're going to get to the questions that will come up next week so that if, um, if we whittle it down to four or five questions, uh, maybe there's the answers they give even reveal the, the need on some of our parts maybe for more questions along that line. And if we aren't going to have a back and forth, I'm on the fence too, I see both sides. Mm -hmm. um, I want us to have, um, I'd like the council members to have equal opportunity to those conversations, but schedules being what they are and that meeting being next week, I'm not sure. I'm, three of us are traveling for three days also. Yep. Um, so can you give us a little bit of your thoughts on the questions for next week and whether or not we'll work on those today or how we might go about figuring out what that conversation looks Yeah, like? I mean, I, th I know that, the, so... Yeah. Lehua, can do you I, have? Yeah. Oh, Lehua is going to jump. I, it looks like she's going to jump if I don't just, give her the opportunity. You want to follow up, or Cindy? Just a quick thing before Lehua, go ahead, be on your way. <laughs> um, you can make it whatever it is that works for this body. So if you're realizing something now that you hadn't realized last week and you want to add a segment that includes back and forth, you can do that. So you, there's enough flexibility uh, within the, the statute that you can adjust as you go. So as long as you're equitable to the candidates, you're fine, Okay. right? Okay. Lehua? I was just going to add that the council during your discussion last week had indicated you each might be interested in coming up with questions. And so as staff, we had a follow-up item tomorrow for your liaisons to be checking in with you to help compile those questions if you wanted that assistance so that we could have those set and ready for the group to, for you, the council to review. And then um, as council member Fowler mentioned that we would put those in a hat and there would be some sort of random draw. That was the level of discussion from last week, just as a reminder if it's helpful. Great. Other questions? So instead of straw polling this right now, let's, why don't you think about it? Okay. Um, since we will be coming back uh, in the work session, uh, we can straw poll uh, 
this later if if that is something that we want to do. If not, you know, not that big of a deal. Uh, as far as the questions go, <coughs> to lay who's point, if, if think about the questions. If you have questions that that you're interested in, uh, maybe share them uh, with staff today. Uh, and then you know we will have those out, and then you know the four or the up to four of you uh, who will be uh, moving forward uh, will get those questions uh, this week. Does that work? Okay. Um, so the process today. So in order to uh, have the five minutes where where each of you move forward. You know, we we had some discussion last week. Uh, we've had some uh, individual individual discussion as well about you know how to make it as equitable as possible, so that you know if we if we just gave you know called you all you know from a, a list, uh, those at the bottom of the list would have the benefit of having heard what everybody else was saying, which would potentially be a disadvantage to uh, the lucky one of you who is going to be going first. Uh, so we wanted to make it um, as you know as unpredictable, I guess, as possible. Um, you know, part of what we're looking for is just getting to know you better, um, to hear what you have to say. That's why you know these five minutes we don't have a lot of requirements. We're we're more interested in just uh, to hearing what your uh, general approach is. So we have a very very high tech. Yes, we have a very high-tech uh, system here uh, of a bowl full of uh, paper numbers. Um, and so what we're going to do, so Vanna White here, um, will, you know, will have each of you come up, um, take a number, and that number will... Uh, we're drying it. We've tricked we're drying you. it. I'm drying it. <laughs> I think hey. Amy just asked if so. So do you know draw. what? So sorry, no, no, Vanna White, and you know, you guys thought you were going to draw numbers. I guess, I guess you're not. So, um, so what I will do is go through this list. I will call one of you forward. Uh, I, I'll pull two names out. The first name uh, you are going to be on. The second name you will have, um, you know, some time to uh, prepare your thought. Um, does that work, council members? Um, I, either way, either way, um, okay. I, I have it here. I can just, I, I can just go ahead and You're going to have to read those names anyway. Yeah. Um, so if we don't have any other questions, uh, uh I will Mr. Chair? read the, fr oh yes. May I? Yes. Personal privilege? Yes. Uh, just Council to, Member Johnston. So we may be taking notes on laptops, um, tablets, those kind of things. So for typing, don't get thrown off by that. Uh, I may stand up personally at times. Uh, if this goes like an hour and a half, I will definitely stand up at times. Um, just to stretch my legs, but I'm not leaving the chamber. I'm listening. Um, hopefully, I won't throw anybody off as well. Just to, just so you know, we're listening. So, thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, the first name. Kyle R. Deans, uh, followed by uh, Sasha Luke's Morgan. Kyle, the time is yours. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk with you guys for a few minutes. Um, real quickly, um, my background is in planning. I have a master's degree in city planning and real estate development. So my comments will be based on a planning background. Uh, Fred Kent, who is the founder of Project for Public Spaces, it's a nonprofit, uh, once stated, if you plan cities for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic. If you plan cities for people and places, you get people and places. Uh, my focus today is on the walkability of downtown. Uh, a vibrant downtown is not only residential, commercial, and attractions such as retail, uh, arts, venues, and parks. It's also um, m must have walkability to be a vibrant downtown. Uh, some of the key um, walkability create is created when pedestrians feel safe, have interaction, and stimulants as they wander and walk through downtown. Uh, a couple of keys to walkability. Uh, first is simple amenities. Amenities like benches, planters, uh, garbage cans, things like that. Uh, a few months back, I walked over to People's Coffee from my place on 3rd South and Main, 
and I noticed when I was done with my coffee cup at People's Coffee that there was no place to throw my garbage away or to recycle it until I got to Main Street. There's a lot of areas. Main Street's fantastic. Main Street's our most walkable uh, street in the city, uh, but simple amenities like that provide opportunities where people feel welcome, feel like they're supposed to be there and that they belong. Um, the second is physical, visual and physical barriers that come into play. Um, things like traffic calming devices. Uh, Third South uh, is a perfect example in my mind where pedestrians do feel much safer. I know the bike lanes have been controversial over the years since they were installed. Um, however, from a pedestrian's point of view, you have pedestrians, you have street trees, you have a dedicated bike lane, you have parking, then you have your traffic lane, and then a median. The nice thing about that is that there is there's such a buffer between a high-speed traffic, even 25 miles an hour is high speed in downtown walkable areas, that it allows people to feel more safe and more secure, and the medians provide a refuge halfway through the street crossing, if that's what they choose to do. Um, Main Street also provides that with the planter boxes, with the tracks platforms, things like that. Those are refuges from crossing streets. Um, another major component of walkable communities and making streets feel more comfortable pedestrians is visually narrowing the streets. Um, Edward Glazer, an economics professor from Harvard, um, wrote a book called Triumph of the City. Some of his key points were the narrowing of streets, not physically, but visually. Um, our streets are 132 feet wide, back of sidewalk to back of sidewalk. Those are large streets. We all know we have gigantic streets here in Salt Lake. The issue that comes into play and what visually narrows streets is when the surrounding buildings are equal to or greater than the width of the street in height. So if a building is 132 feet tall or taller, it will visually narrow the street. A perfect example of this is if you were to cross uh, State Street at 350 South, stand on that median, if you were to look north towards the Capitol where the buildings are all taller than the street is wide, that street physically and visually looks narrower than if you turn south and look down State Street to the south. The reason again is because those buildings are taller than the street is wide. Um, one thing that concerns me that I think would need to be addressed as a council member is that our D1 zone, the downtown zone where we allow the highest densities and the highest buildings and structures is that our corner minimums are only 100 feet tall. Um, that should at least be looked at and addressed um, and possibly put up to 130, 135 feet in order to, to successfully visually narrow those roads. Another area is the D3 and the D4 zones along 300 West, um, the same street width there. However, the heights are 75 feet by right, 90, 90 feet or 120 feet by conditional use. I think that is something that needs to be addressed as our city continues to grow outward and as we uh, continue to add more residents, more businesses, and as we want to be a more walkable, vibrant city. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Deans. Uh, Sasha Lukes Morgan, followed by Miles Petty. Hi, my name is Sasha Lux Morgan. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. I am currently a neuroscience graduate student working on my PhD at the University of Utah. My goal is to understand um, how the brain wires up to make a map of how cells talk to each other um, and how they talk to each other in response to something painful happening. So I'm interested in looking at this not only from the level of the actual cells but also from a molecular level. Um, I spend a lot of time on the basic science aspects of my research, but also thinking about how the research that we're doing always needs to be, always needs to be framed in terms of its relevance to human health. Utah has been in the top 10 for opioid overdose deaths for the past 10 years. This is too high, and much of the impact has been placed on Salt Lake City. My thesis research allows me to look at the opioid crisis not only from the perspective of a concerned citizen, but also from the viewpoint of someone who is well versed in the neurological states that can result in reliance on an addiction to pain medication. The reason that I got into science is the same reason that so many people get into public service. I want to make my community and people's lives better. It's why I've started to think of many of the problems facing our city from a public health and scientific perspective. 
I don't believe that there is a single issue that wouldn't benefit from having someone with scientific training on board to look at it. Questions about air quality, water resources, and addiction are only three of the most obvious examples. Many of the key problems facing our city are multifaceted. They require solutions that will draw on many fields of experience. The current members of City Council represent a wide range of interests in our city, and I believe that in my role as a scientist, I am well qualified to serve and represent the residents of District 4. I think that one of the best things that City Council is empowered to do is to make our city a healthier place to live. Our infrastructure is a key component of this. Salt Lake has done an amazing job managing parks and other green spaces. I'm glad that we're doing what we can do to encourage people to go outside. Many studies have shown the benefit of green spaces for city residents. It's really an investment that we can make in the physical and mental health of Salt Lake City residents. I want everyone to be able to use and enjoy our city and to feel that they have the same access to our streets and our parks. It's why in my application questionnaire, I argued for increasing the number of streetlights, but especially in the downtown areas. Although there is not a direct causal link between streetlights and reduced crime, better lighting increases people and especially women's sense that they are able to be outside in their neighborhoods at night. I've spent the last three years living on 900 East. It's a lovely neighborhood. My neighbors are fantastic. My neighborhood is full of wonderful people. But when I need to go out and walk my dog at night, even if it's just around the block, there are large stretches of my walk that are completely pitch black. There are no street lights. I've heard from many other women who live in District 4 that this change would allow them to use the city more at night and without needing to rely on a car to get around to just run a quick errand. Making Salt Lake City easier to live in without a car is just one small way that we can work to improve our air quality. Studies from other cities have shown the wide-ranging benefits that come from even a modest reduction in PM 2.5. It can reduce the number of premature deaths, greatly increase the number of life years, and sharply reduce respiratory and cardiovascular visits to the hospital. Our air quality has been shown to negatively impact the health of Salt Lake City residents from cardiovascular issues to childhood asthma, as well as potential risk to prenatal development. I want to push for concrete steps that we can take now to improve our air quality. Salt Lake City is progressive in so many ways. We're a model not only within Utah, but nationally on LGBTQ rights. We are working hard to solve the homelessness crisis and to live out our progressive values. I want to see Salt Lake continue to be a progressive leader, and I think there's real value in the inclusion of a scientific perspective in our city government. District 4 has been represented by a young, pro young progressive voice for the past three years. I'm asking you to place your faith in another young progressive. I am eager for the opportunity to use my skills and training to benefit District 4. Again, thank you all so much for your time this afternoon. I really appreciate the seriousness and thought with which you've been approaching filling the council vacancy. I know that I am the best candidate to fill this position, and I hope that you will choose to appoint me to represent District 4. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Ms. Lux Morgan. Uh, Miles Petty followed by uh, Mariano Rio Domingo. Uh, esteemed members of the City Council, staff, uh, and everyone. Our car got proud last week for the fourth time in six months, so it wasn't the first time I felt vulnerable. And I should have known better that whether or not I had to fumble around to get the car seat out and get the baby inside, and whether or not I tried to grab one more bag of groceries with the other hand, and whether I stepped carefully onto the porch landing, and whether the weather is bad or not, I have to remember to lock the car. Because I know if I don't, I'll come out like this morning to see a deserted street, papers strung all over the passenger seat, old CDs flung around, the trunk flung open. But I'm not done hoping for this city and this district. Because in case that you missed it, this isn't the first time that I've been here. It's been years, a few, just three, since you last saw me knocking on doors and walking uh, the blocks and talking with scores of District 4 folks and friends and neighbors and strangers, a labor of love and learning and earning their trust and their votes and churning our ideas for the city of ours. Spoiler alert, I came 48 votes shy of the general and the chance to spend 48 months as an amenable representative. You bet it is imperative to mention the others have moved on. But I am still here, 
and ready to fill in the last 12 of those months, or 11 or however many are left. I'm impressed with this place and I'm ready to face our objectives, replace what is failing, and reclaim our spot at the top of the best places to live, even if we don't ever tell anyone about it. I could spend all of my time sharing the dreams in my mind of the projects I'd like to pursue, like new streetcars and bike lanes, more plants on the highways and everywhere, more nodes to make neighborhoods more neighborly, decrease yearly fatalities, inspire good design, and align the legislature more toward us salt lakers. But this appointment is not for that long, just a year, so it's clearly best to begin with what we know. We've got <clears throat> We've got sewers eroding, they're 100 years old, we've got potholes and divots all over the road, but our city creeps growing. We don't need to be told we're facing a dearth of affordable homes. And that's not to mention people without homes, and the road home is closing, exposing our need for more beds. The lieutenant governor said he'd push it back, but we might need to push him back a little to make sure we're not left without adequate capacity. And one more thing, the federal government is shut down right now over funding for a border wall. But functionally, we've got one in Salt Lake, I-15. It effectively divides the east and west sides without even trying. It splits our city in half. So let's work on that. Get some customers from Harvard, Yale into businesses in Glendale and get the name Rose Park to sound as sweet as Sugar House. And here in downtown, District 4, rich and poor houses from before the turn of the last century, I know you. I walk your streets every day. I play on your grass and your concrete. I meet your people and their dogs. Even <clears throat> if I have to try harder to lock my car door, I still like our odds for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petty. Uh, Numeriana Rio Domingo, are you here? Okay. So we will then go uh, to Michael Iverson followed by Brianne Miller. Council, thank you for having me. I grew up here in District 4 in the Central 9th neighborhood on Jefferson Street. Uh, I was raised by a single mother in poverty before the light rail and the condos and the Lebanese restaurant. Uh, through my life, I've worked a number of low-paying jobs in the hospitality industry, and I've spent most of my adult life in the very low-income bracket of 50% AMI. Uh, when I started looking for an apartment of my own, it became clear that my class of people wasn't really meant to live downtown. Um, in 2011, I found an affordable housing project on uh, 200 South that had a wait list of over 700 people on it. Um, now, as much as I love my mother, I didn't want to live with her into my 30s, so I asked if there was any way I could skip ahead on the list, and they said if I happened to call the office on the day that they had someone move out, then I could move ahead in the line and get the apartment. So every morning after I got off from my second job at 8 a.m., I called the office and asked if they had any vacancies. Um, day after day, week after week, for four months, the answer was no, until they finally said, uh, yeah, we have someone moving out today. If you can get down here in half an hour, the apartment's yours. I didn't have a car at the time, so I literally ran to the apartment and signed the lease sight unseen. Um, now, I love my apartment, but uh, if, I, if I want to move, I, there's no way I can find anything affordable even far out into the suburbs. And of course, it's not all doom and gloom. I love this city. I've spent nearly my entire life here in District 4. Uh, I love the walkability, the access to the arts and culture. Uh, I love the coffee shop every half block. Um, but I, my love for the community would be nothing without, uh, without action, and that's why I've served for the last six years as chair of Central City Neighborhood Council. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk to thousands of District 4 residents about the issues that matter to them. I've gone door to door across District 4 talking about issues like property crime, air quality, ideas for economic development, and solutions to preserve historic neighborhoods. I also served for four years on the Salt Lake City Human Rights Commission, representing District 4 and working to listen to and empower marginalized communities within our boundaries. Sometimes it meant shouting their concerns to the mayor's office, sometimes it meant uh, shutting up and getting out of their way. Um, and I'm not afraid to shy away from 
or I won't shy away from controversy if it matters to my constituents, and that's why when the mayor fired the diversity director after 20 years of service, I called a public meeting and asked her important uh, but tough questions uh, about her vision for the future of, of diversity and human rights in the city. I didn't get any answers, and a month later I found I was no longer allowed to finish my term as chair of that commission, but I don't regret for a moment stepping up for my constituents to demand answers, whether it's from the mayor or from a large property developer or from the state legislature or anyone who wields power over the people. Uh, now as I've considered running for the seat over this last year, I've dived deeper into the inner workings of the city council. Uh, with a handful of exception for uh, consent agendas, I listened to the audio recording of every single city council meeting of 2018, and I took notes. I was taking notes when uh, Councilman Wharton forgot to bring a pen to his first meeting, and uh, when uh, the mayor's top lobbyist told you we didn't expect any legislation on the inland port in 2018. Council, you have a difficult choice of 20 and one applicants, including several friends of mine, and I'm not the first applicant to tell you that I'm ready to hit the ground running, but I guarantee I'm the only applicant that has 200 pages of notes detailing the work you've done over the last year. The turnaround between this appointment and the election in November is very short, and you need someone who has intimate knowledge of the issues you're dealing with starting February. And while my financial situation has gotten a little better over the years, I don't think it hurts to have someone on the council who has struggled to find housing and isn't ashamed to speak from personal experience about needing federal subsidies to stay off the streets. Last year, someone asked me if I had any hobbies other than politics and public policy, and I like bad sci-fi and comic books um, and food, as you can tell. Um, but if there's one thing in life I take seriously, it's Salt Lake City. Uh, yesterday, I forwarded you a copy of a letter of recommendation written by the chair of the Salt Lake Community Network and signed by 12 community leaders across the entire city. Uh, they know the work I've done in this district, and they trust me to listen to their concerns in your district, and they've all stood up to support me. Uh, I'm ready, I'm willing, I've lived the history, and I'm doing the work, and I hope they'll consider voting for me to join you on the council. Thank you, Mr. Iverson. Brianne Miller, followed by Katrina Katie Sign. Over the past several days, I traveled to a small town in Pennsylvania with my boyfriend and his family uh, to attend a funeral of their dear friend. The lack of direct flights and a substantial drive in snowy weather left me with some time to finally begin Michelle Obama's book. She, in the beginning of her book, makes a case uh, for her future successes by describing her history and describing her early years as she grew up. I myself grew up in Las Vegas with two siblings. My dad was a plumber, my mom was excuse me, first a waitress, and then started her career with the school district. She was a bus driver for many years and worked her way up to retire as a supervisor. Her union and the school district supplied her with a secure position so she could support our family. Our first home in Las Vegas was just around the corner from what is now known as the Stratosphere Hotel. If you're familiar with it, it's a lovely area of town. <laughs> On the corner of my street was a tattoo parlor and a bar we moved around Las Vegas quite a bit. I attended seven different schools by the time I graduated high school. What I did grow up with was an immense love and support network. I also grew up in a place where I ended up in handcuffs twice as a child because of the people who lived around me. My parents and my circumstances made me reach for the things that had been out of reach for my family. When I applied for college, I had no idea what I was doing. My parents encouraged me but they did not understand the process. No one in my family had ever gone to college. I applied to the University of Utah on a whim. I had once visited the campus with a friend and her mom, and it seemed like a nice place, very different from what I knew in Las Vegas. As I settled into life in Salt Lake City, I found what I wanted in my home. I found a community. I quickly got involved in the College Democrats at the University of Utah. The group had fizzled out due to some absent leadership, so I became chair. And then I became involved in the Young Democrats of Utah, the College, excuse me, the Salt Lake County Democratic Party Board, and the Utah Democratic Party Board. Each of these boards was a working board. If you wanted something done, you did it yourself. These boards were partisan, yes, but what they taught me was that service was always about getting the right people into office, 
the people who would represent us well through their experience or their education and a commitment to service. It was also about engaging with voters to bring them into the political process to show them the value of political engagement and public service. As I graduated from college, my commitment to service only solidified. I knew that the law was a passion of mine, but I also know that I needed to stay true to my commitment to public service. So I sought after and obtained a joint degree program where I also obtained a master's in public administration. I stand before you today because of the support from my family, but also the support and opportunities I received from this community. I worked in politics to uh, improve this community. I served internships with the Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid in Washington, D.C., and in the state legislature so that I knew how to make change actually happen. I joined boards of the Utah State Bar to give back, provide services like pro bono and clinics. I served on the University of Utah's Young Alumni Board to raise tens of thousands of dollars in scholarships. After the 2016 election, I admit I was in shock. The wind was knocked out of me for longer than I care to admit. But what I remembered is that this local government is where I stand, and it is my community. This city stands up for me and for women. It stands up for the LGBT community and is a safe place for my trans sibling to visit me. The city has made a conscious commitment to protect those with the least among us, including those experiencing homelessness. I have the education, the experience, and the commitment to join the city council and represent the residents of District 4. I will represent this district not only in the big shiny issues, but also the grid of daily city life. I will represent this issue on the water and sewage pipes, the snow plows, the potholes, taxation and fees, park maintenance, roads, sidewalks and bike lanes, and everything in between. I seek this position because I'm prepared to address these issues and I've learned how to learn and assess new issues quickly. As a prosecutor, I'm trained to be an advocate, even when the decision is not a popular one. I dig deep to learn and research the issues I face because the decisions I make can have far-reaching consequences. I confidently defend my position, but also listen to and consider opposing arguments, no matter who is making them. And then I can walk away amicably from these intense discussions. Just ask any of the defense attorneys that I work with. I'm also fortunate to have an employer who will support me in seeking this position. I bought my home in Council uh, District 4 seven years ago. As it continues to develop, I have witnessed the impact that the city can have on my neighborhood, from literally giving it a name to bringing forward a sense of community. I thank the time of the staff in working towards this process, the council in considering all of these applicants, and I hope that I will get your support for an appointment to the city council. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, Katie Sign, followed by Paul Ballou. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to address the Salt Lake City Council and all of you today. I love Salt Lake City. I was born and raised in the avenues. Um, for the last five years, I've called the downtown area of Salt Lake City home. I'm proud to say that I was born here at LDS Hospital, chose to be educated here mostly. I actually helped create the very first student government for Ensign Elementary School when I was in fifth grade. Um, and, and having lived in Italy, the UK, NYC, and the DC area, I choose to work, live, and play here. I founded the Motion Picture Association of Utah when I was 19 years old because I knew I wanted to work in film and television production. And I knew that our industry needed such a voice in order to maintain a vibrant industry. Um, because of that, I'm able to work in film production to this day. Um, I'm beyond inspired listening to everyone here present. I'm beyond inspired that there are 21 other applicants that feel like they are empowered enough to help represent our city um, and take on the extraordinary responsibility to serve and represent District 4. I am here to ask for your vote for me to represent District 4. And that being said, I'm also here to talk about how I feel about public service and all that it entails. Research proves it is a basic human need to be seen and to be heard, and I could not agree more. The, this is why local and neighborhood government is so critical and vital to communities and the larger city. It gives people a voice and to have conversation about issues that affect and impact their daily lives. It allows people to be involved in their community, to address their needs and wants, and know that they matter as individuals and that their unique contribution is essential to the larger collective. I believe no one should matter more or less than anyone else. 
And this creates inclusivity. It affords us the ability to celebrate and build on our diversity. It is, as easy, it is equally as important to see the person standing on the corner of 400 South and 500 East because I see them every day and offer the services and solutions that you all and we've worked together to create to support their circumstance. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Salt Lake City, we've done a good job. We're on a bunch of best lists. Best place to live, best place to visit, best place for business, best place for millennials to move. It's good, but we can't just sit around patting ourselves on the back. There are still issues that must be addressed. Good public policy equals all vested parties being able to be in the room and be present and or represented at the table, where all perspectives are presented, thoughtfully discussed, and considered. And we are all here because we are interested in crafting good public policy. I'm not partisan, loyal first to my district, to the people that I represent, a diverse, dynamic part of Salt Lake City, including business owners, residents, a lot of homeowners, but many renters parks, elementary schools, retirement communities, newly revitalized areas of the city and others that need improvement. I have many friends and neighbors that live and work and own businesses in District 4, and I know it's a serious matter to ask to represent them, along with many people that I look forward to getting to know better. We have many needs that I look forward to addressing in District 4, including clean air, affordable housing, living, growth, inclusivity, transportation, neighborhood revitalization, gentrification, and homelessness. The inversion, for example is a natural occurring phenomenon that was here long before we ever settled the Salt Lake Valley and will probably be here long after we all go to that big ski hill in the sky. But the ensuing pollution and harmful particulate matter that get trapped under the inversion is not natural, and the damaging effects are within our control to mitigate. Everyone deserves to breathe clean air, from the baby taking its first breath at St. Mark's Hospital to br the Bryant Junior High student running the mile at PE, the foodie en enjoying chocolate and cheese at Caputo's, to us sitting right here having this conversation. We all need clean air to live. It's a basic human right. I think that when understanding issues is of utmost importance, it's, it's first to be able to discern objectively what can be controlled and what can't. So that that supports um, in a way that everyone has equal opportunity to not only have their basic human needs and rights represented, but also the potential to thrive. I offer a unique perspective, the conversation of well-being. It's valuable for this government body and for legislators to talk about. Individual well-being research proves that individual well-being is infectious and contributes to neighborhoods, government, ultimately our surrounding cities, and eventually the well-being of the entire state of Utah. Working together, navigating objectively, we can create strategies, collaborate to continue to strengthen the fabric of this city, to represent everyone, to listen to one another, to strive to understand, seek to include and enhance the well-being and resilience of all of our residents. I love living in Utah, and that said, I love Salt Lake City. And that is why I am passionate about seeking the appointment to represent District 4 on the Salt Lake City Council. I feel connected to the city, and I'm dedicated, hardworking, willing to serve, and put in the time um, I believe Time. the unique distinctive perspectives affords us um, that we each have will ultimately contribute. Thank you, Ms. Sign. Um, Paul Ballou, followed by Scott Little. Mr. Chair, uh, dear council members. <clears throat> I want to start by thanking the council and the Salt Lake City resident for taking the time to consider my application for the vacancy for District 4. I moved to Utah from France at the end of 2010 and I've lived in Salt Lake City for the last four, four years. It took me a bit more than four years to save enough money to go back to France and finally visit my family. I was uh, filled with anticipation. I would finally see my family again, I would be back home. The truth is, during that trip, I realized one thing. France was not home anymore. Home is in Utah, and home is in Salt Lake City. I've seen the Salt Lake City change a lot over the last few years, and overall for the best. Uh, we can all be thankful for the elected members of the City Council for their hard work, uh, serving their constituents with high moral standards, and uh, the accomplishment they, uh, over the last few years. Although still having the highest crime rate in the city, District 4 has seen incredible improvement in safety thanks to the funding the council approved 
for additional police staff member. Operation Rio Grande has helped many of our residents experiencing homelessness uh, to break a vicious cycle and get a new chance on life. But hard work will still be needed in the coming years. Salt Lake City will be facing major challenges. With the nomination of our city to represent the United States bid for the Winter Olympics, Salt Lake City may once again be under the world's spotlights. Budget decisions made in the coming years will be critical for the bid to be successful. The implementation of the transit master plan, the repair of the roads, the construction of the new airport terminal, and continued funding for the construction of homeless resource centers and affordable housing are essential elements for this success. The coming years are also a great opportunity to show the world what makes Salt Lake City such a great place to live. It is a chance for the people of Salt Lake City to continue and accelerate a transition towards renewable forms of energy. We have, a, we have the chance to be an example on how, when working together, a city can successfully address its air pollution problem. I would like to make the case for myself as an applicant for filling the seat on District 4. As an optical X-ray engineer working on scanners uh, used in cancer research, I work with complex systems on a daily basis and have to be innovative uh, in finding solutions to problems for which there is no manuals or no protocol. I've learned that hard work, dedication, teamwork, and professionalism are essential quality for the job. I believe these to be qualities that are essential in order to serve on the City Council. I'm currently in charge of the maintenance of almost 200 imaging systems, which combine are worth close to $50 million. Strategic planning, proper budget management, predicted revenue stream are concepts that I had to learn to run a successful operation. And I'm hoping to use these skills while serving on the City Council to continue the efforts for maintaining a healthy budget. I believe that I can be a good advocate for the residents of District 4, and I also believe that I can represent the many people that moved from out of state and from out of the country to make Salt Lake City their home. Representing the diversity of the population is important, but when serving on the City Council, it is important for each member to remember that they are not only serving their constituents, but that they are also working together to serve all the people of Salt Lake City. On April 6 last year, I became an American citizen. It is difficult to describe the feeling I had that day. I felt more than ever that I was part of the community. I vowed that day to do my best to never take that chance for granted and serve my fellow men to the best of my ability. It would be a great honor to serve on the City Council and to express my gratitude with my dedication and hard work for the good people of the city that I now call home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ballou. Uh, Scott Little, followed by Ryan James Parker. Hi, I'm Scott Little. Um, I feel that um, all the candidates, we've all kind of really addressed the issues in District 4 and Salt Lake City in our Q&As, had a chance to kind of skim through everybody's answers. And I mean, issues seem pretty uniform within, within Salt Lake City and District 4. So now I wanted to talk to you about who I am. Considering you are the ones voting, you're the ones who are going to have to work with the new city council member, I'm going to touch on a couple of issues. I'm going to touch on who I am, my professional background, what makes me excited about this position? Who is Scott Little? I was born in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Became a US citizen right here in Salt Lake City in 2010. I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I received my undergraduate degree from Temple University and an MBA from St. Joe's University in Philadelphia and lived in Center City, Philadelphia for over 16 years. My now wife recruited me to move to Park City in 2008 while we were both working for the US Ski and Snowboard team in Park City. In 2012, we moved to District 4. We bought a house on McClellan Street near the university, but kept our townhouse in Park City. We were testing the waters in Salt Lake City. Being a city person at heart, 
I wasn't sure Salt Lake City was going to have enough diversity and energy for me. We both fell in love with everything Salt Lake. In 2014, we moved to our current house on 800 East and sold our townhouse in Park City and became a one-car family. My professional journey. While completing my MBA, I started a 16-year career in nonprofit management, focusing on fundraising, marketing, and finance. While in nonprofit, I was fortunate enough to work for two amazing organizations, a handful of organizations, two I'm going to focus on, two amazing organizations that helped open my eyes to the legislative process and the complexities within. I was the first executive director of Bike Utah, a state advocacy and education organization. As the executive director, I became familiar with creating and ultimately passing bike-friendly legislation on a state level. My experience with Bike Utah led me to working with Salt Lake City's Transportation Department to restart the Mayor's Bicycle Advisory Committee. I chaired the committee for two years. This experience gave me incredible insight into the inner workings of Salt Lake City's governmental process. Next, as the Deputy Director of Tracy Aviary, I was introduced to partnering with Salt Lake City and the city's budget process. From April to June, I followed the process very closely, from the mayor's recommendation to city council's review, adjustment, and final approval. For us at Tracy Avery, it was a very nerve-wracking time. Two years ago, I took the jump from nonprofit to no profit and purchased Tizanti on 11th East uh, in Sugar House, small tea shop over there, where I'm invested every day in the fabric of what makes Salt Lake City great through communicating with our customers on a daily basis, collecting and paying taxes, and having a number of employees who live in the city. I'm truly invested in Salt Lake City. Why am I excited about this position? So I kind of thought long and hard about this, and what really popped out to me was an answer was right in the Salt Lake City's website. So slc.gov. So .gov. G O V. G, growth. It's exciting to see all the growth in the city, from small businesses like Tizanti to restaurants and bars to new apartments and condos being built and the influx of a booming tech industry. Opportunity. I believe Salt Lake City provides its residents with opportunities. The city is relatively affordable, relatively safe and easy to get around, and amazingly friendly. Vibe. The city is gaining more and more great energy every day. I talk to people who are passionate about everything in the city. The outdoors, the arts, culture, music, shops and boutiques, and the university. So to wrap up, I touched on diversity. I realize standing here I may not be the most uh, diverse looking candidate, but I feel diversity in thinking is important as diversity in appearance. I can bring years of valuable experience to city council. I am honest, creative, and optimistic. Think big, vote little. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Little. Uh, Ryan Parker, followed by uh, Analia Valdemoros. First off, I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, thank you to the City Council for having this. Uh, to say that I'm honored to be standing here would be an understatement. I'm honored because four years ago, I came out to this city from Orm, Utah, not even remotely thinking of politics. I came out to this city seeking recovery. And during that time, I was able to begin a different life, begin a different course. I was able to reevaluate what it took for me to raise my children. I got to pursue arts and music. And then I found myself a place on Rio Grande, a place that really changed a lot of things for me. In fact, it changed everything for me. And it really decided right then and there that there was a community that wasn't being understood. Whether I read about it in the papers or watched it on the news or whether I came to these council meetings and you know, got to hear different people's opinions and shared experiences. For the last three years, I've worked at the Road Home Emergency Shelter. And then for the last three years, I've got to witness the fallout of looking at how we're going to reevaluate our resource centers. When we're talking about bed capacity, when we're talking about mental health treatment, when we're talking about criminal justice reform. 
and that's what brings me here. Last night, I provided shelter to over 594 men. Two weeks ago, I provided shelter to over 265 women. Grandparents, veterans, teachers. I have those who suffer with autism walk into my doors. I've had the blinds, I've had the deaf. And I've also had the honor of being friends with every single one of them that's came to me. The reason why I'm running for city council, the reason why I want to bring my voice is because I know every single resource from Ogden to Provo. I know every single aspect of these things. I know every single aspect we need to know about homelessness, about agencies, and what we can do to try to curb this trajectory that we're seeing. Because homelessness is rising all across the country. We got to see last month 121 people, 121 people died after recently experiencing homelessness. Three of them were at the shelter. These are the big issues that take upon me. When we discuss affordable housing, when we discuss bed capacities, when we discuss every single aspect of what it is that we are setting, because I don't look at Operation Rio Grande as this is what needed to happen. I look at Operation Rio Grande as that for some reason we got to a point where we felt that this was an appropriate response. We didn't have Operation Affordable Housing. We didn't have Operation State Hospitals. We didn't have Operation Raising Wages. Those would have been very more sufficient than what we had. And Operation Rio Grande wasn't more special than anything else. To people inside the shelter, it was just noise outside. The thing that I want to offer this council is a gift. And those are the names of people who stay in our doors every day who seek not equality of outcome, but just equality of opportunity. I want to look at our areas and not see apartment buildings like the 600 lofts be built with affordable housing money and then go and say that to make this rent, you have to make double the income. We go back to cherry picking our poverty. If we build affordable housing, but we're still exclusive, then who did we build it for? I'm here not to prostrate, not to pontificate or be pious. I'm not here to obfuscate or obstruct. I'm here to bring progressive and I'm here to be resourceful. And that is what I bring. When it comes to homelessness in the city, the buck stops here, period. I'm a single parent and I get to walk my children through these, through these doors. I get to walk them all over this city. I have lived downtown since I moved out here and it's been an honor to do so. This city has served me well and I want to serve it back. Really, what more could I say that this council wouldn't already know, that the mayor's office doesn't already know, that the county mayor's office doesn't know, that the governor's office doesn't already know, that City Weekly doesn't already know, the Daily, the Daily Herald, the Deseret News, or the Tribune already know? I'm asking this council for the opportunity to live up to the hype. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Uh, Anna Valdemoros, uh, followed by Jen Colby. Respected Council, I'm Anna Valdemoros, and I love our city. I truly appreciate and thank all of you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, given the quality of the candidates, the Council is faced with making a difficult decision. Uh, however, because of my unique education and experience, if appointed, I have no doubt that I'll be hit the ground running on day one. My desire to serve on the Council comes from the inspiration I find in the tremendous work um, already accomplished our city leaders and its dedicated employees, who are some of the greatest people I've ever worked with. As a young intern, I started with the Economic Development Department when there were only two staff members. I was fortunate enough to be allowed to grow with that department. Later, I joined the City Planning Division. And during my time there, my most memorable work was the creation of the West Salt Lake Master Plan, the North Temple Master Plan, and the transit station area zoning district implemented on North Temple and later on 400 South, uh, that corridor. It's extremely fulfilling to watch a series of projects are worked on, on uh, become successful realities. Um, later, when I started working for a nonprofit community development organization called NeighborWorks, I was actually able to apply some of those ideas that we had in the master plan uh, in the area that I served. 
I became their community-based economic development di director, where I gained an even better understanding of the work these organizations do for comprehensive community development. In the private sector, my first business, Argentina's West Empanadas, was fostered by our wonderful downtown farmers market. Without the city's involvement in that market, I wouldn't be here today. I set the goal to open the first empanada shop in Salt Lake City, and I did, and it's only about a block away from here. The second, Square <coughs> Kitchen, Salt Lake City's first culinary incubator kitchen, was the result of an amazing public-private par public partnership with the city's sustainability department. We opened nine months ago in District 2, and we now help over 40 small food companies that um, do business all over Salt Lake and the state. The kitchen has been a catalyst um, for economic development in the Poplar Grove neighborhood. Aside from a professional pursuit, my heritage and life experience uniquely qualify me for the open position. I'm a 30-something Hispanic immigrant woman that has uh, recently become an American citizen, educated locally while living far away from her native home. So Lixidio raised me and was the only close family I had for some time. I truly epitomize the American dream and shared so many of the common experiences with those of our community that have, been sacrif that have sacrificed so much in order to call Lake City home. Because of this great city, I've been given so many opportunities to succeed despite my accent, despite my skin color, or my gender. If appointed, the council will gain a better understanding and a perspective of the city's ethnically diverse population and I know how important this is to the city council. If appointed, the council will work with an inclusive and reasonable voice from, from the private sector. If appointed, you will have selected someone that is concerned with our air quality, transportation, and affordable housing issues. If selected, I will build upon the great policies and procedures already in place and tackle those that are coming our way this year, yet not be afraid to review and change those that are just not working. I know how to make things happen in the neighborhoods of our city. I know how the city works. I have actually addressed neighborhood issues. I understand the city's processes. I've experiences, I have excuse me, I experienced the difficulties of budgetary constraints. More importantly, the council has a wonderful opportunity today to appoint someone that can also represent a large portion of our city, currently without a seat at the table. I will be honored to represent District 4. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Valdemoros. Uh, Jen Colby, followed by Raina Nelson. Thank you, members of the council, uh, neighbors, and friends. It's an honor to be considered for the appointment to fill the remaining District 4 council term. I ran in 2015, and honestly, I didn't expect the opportunity to come up so soon. As you're well aware, there's less than a year left with an election cycle rapidly approaching. It will be a steep learning curve for even the most experienced individual. As a longtime resident, it's gratifying to see that so many of us have applied and would be willing to take on this challenge. With both talent and time to give, I believe I'm the best qualified to do so at this point. To be quite honest, I waited to apply until I was confident I could clear my schedule, reduce outside commitments, and make service to District 4 the highest priority. Additionally, the encouragement of supporters across the district and city helped convince me that my style of leadership is valued. I'm prepared to step into the role and be an effective representative immediately. As to qualifications, first and foremost, I've dedicated my life to public and community service. This includes professional experience in public involvement and partnerships in the U.S. Forest Service here in Utah, service learning and community engagement at University of Utah's Bennion Center, collaborative problem solving and teamwork at the Campus Sustainability Office, and organizational leadership on the boards of several local nonprofits. Additionally, I spent formative years in the hospitality and tourism sector. I started my own catering business in high school, worked in food service throughout college, and then worked seasonally as a server, dining room manager, and innkeeper in Alta. Some people learn everything they need to know about life in kindergarten. I learned most everything I needed to know about service to others and community in the restaurant and hospitality world. This included the importance of good timing, hard work, and endurance, accepting complaints gracefully, even when it was the kitchen's fault, setting and respecting boundaries, fostering camaraderie and mentoring, cultivating open-mindedness, tolerance and inclusion, handling crisis management and being willing to ask for help, 
overcoming fear and self-doubt, practicing reasoned risk-taking, tapping into the power of humor and kindness, and so much more. All of these life lessons also translate into public service. In some, good relationships and strong communities matter. Alta was also a special place for reasons beyond world-class skiing. Town Mayor Bill Levitt and his wife Mimi instilled the importance of civic and political participation for everyone, including seasonal employees. After leaving Alta for new opportunities, my husband and I chose to live in District 4 for its character, walkability, transit options, proximity to downtown and the University of Utah, easy access to parks, trails, and natural areas. We remain devoted District 4 residents. As the capital, Salt Lake City is the cultural, civic, and commercial center of the state of Utah. District 4 encompasses the vib its vibrant and dynamic heart. We are the hub of innovation, reinvention, and civic participation. We are uh, local government provides for the health, safety, and welfare of its residents, visitors, and the environment. Delivering essential public services is a fundamental responsibility. Open space, parks, libraries, museums, arts institutions, and more are public goods that contribute meaningfully to our well-being. I have a clear understanding of the roles and responsibilities of the City Council and of being a representative in elective office. One of the main duties of the council is to shape and approve ordinances and policies. I have a deep appreciation for the work and contributions of council and departmental staff who help turn legislative intent into policy research, draft language, and decision options. I also recognize the challenges and opportunities of working from within large organizations and the resource constraints often faced in the public sector. I have wide-ranging interests related to local government. Over the years, I've worked on many relevant issues, from air quality, the oil spill, and local food systems, to utilities rates, transportation projects, and land use plans. I can dive into the details as needed while keeping the bigger picture in mind. I, can, I share many priorities for the district and the city with our outgoing council representative, as well as with neighbors and fellow district residents, business owners, nonprofit leaders, and visitors. In the district, balancing redevelopment with preservation remains an ongoing issue. Housing, affordability, equity, mobility, and sustainability are crucial concerns. Addressing homelessness and the broader needs of our most vulnerable residents remains a key area of focus. The City Council has made good progress towards priority goals in recent years. New funding sources provide an opportunity to accelerate it. At the same time, experts tell us the window is rapidly closing to meaningfully address greenhouse gas emissions and prevent even more severe and widespread climate disruption. Local air quality remains a related challenge. Wise policy and budget decisions can help assure better outcomes for ourselves and future generations. I'm committed to working collaboratively for positive change and a livable, more equitable future for all. In conclusion, I would bring strong organizational, interpersonal collaboration and leadership to the council if I'm selected. It would be a great honor to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Colby. Uh, Renya Nelson followed by Adam Tegelden. Uh, Let me just breathe that out. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you all for adding this into your schedule. I know it's got to be really tough because you guys have a whole city on your hands. So thank you for giving us all the opportunity. Uh, in 2014, I moved, I returned to Salt Lake um, with my business uh, from Los Angeles. I didn't really have a choice of moving, but I was really glad that I landed here. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> when I got settled into District 4, I wound up moving my business down to the Granary into Art Space, uh, where it's been a, a wonderful district to, to raise my small business. Um, I also own a home in District 4, right next to Trolley Square. So this is my city, and this is, my, this is where I come from. Um, in 2015, I approached uh, former councilman Derek Kitchen about a mural project that I thought might be a good idea for the city. Having seen this, uh, take, take, having seen one in Miami, Florida, back in 2010, um, Derek approached the RDA and found a budget for it, and we went through the process of getting that approved with the city. And in September of this year, we did the mural unveiling down at the Granary Row. And it's been a really cool economic uh, development initiative for that district. In addition to that, I'm also on the uh, Granary District Alliance Board, which um, is made up of a bunch of business owners down in the Granary District. It's a really cool board, and I've been able to experience what it's like uh, to compromise with a bunch of 
other people on board. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, being a business owner, I know what it takes to go through budgets, keep a, keep a tight eye on numbers, and collaborate with my team. The median age of this city is 29 years old, and not to unveil my age, but I'm slightly older than that, which makes me feel like I'm a good candidate for that position. Um, I'm dedicated to this community. I love this city, and I really want to see it grow in a prosperous way. I've traveled all over the world, and I've seen cities do wonderful things. I've, seen, I've witnessed wonderful communities. In fact, this, this March, I'm going to the Main Street America program or conference in March on behalf of the Granary District Board to see what other cool and fun ideas there are out there to improve a district. Um, I'm also the... Um, I spawned a group in 2017 um, called the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Business Alumni Group. It represents over 500 business owners, which, which represent thousands of employees in this state and over $650 million in revenue. In addition to that, I was also um, listed by Utah Business Magazine as one of 30 women to watch and also received the cover of my industry's publication for doing outstanding things within my own community. I'm not the best public speaker in the world, as you guys can tell, but I am a really passionate individual, and I really, really care about this city. Tourism is one um, of the aspects that I'd like to put focus on. We have so many people come to this great place all the time, and I think there are some limits to what some small business owners can and can't do in downtown, specifically with the amount of uh, liquor licenses that are distributed by the DABC. I feel like we should have a more thriving downtown despite the fact that there have been plenty of businesses that have opened up in the last few years. In addition to that, I think that the city should really engage not only the people that have applied here, but also the other uh, Main Street America programs, such as the Granary District Alliance and uh, the Main Street District. These groups do all that they can to represent their unique communities, and they're full of passionate community advocates. In addition to this, I also, um, within the Granary District Alliance, we've also pushed to, um, we are pushing to build what we're calling a culture district, which would mainly be a space, hopefully down in the Granary District, that would allow for uh, cultural festivals, farmers markets, and whatnot to occur because I think that the library is pretty, it's probably too expensive to close down from time to time. With that said, and despite my um, ability to speak publicly and very well, um, other candidates have done a far better job. I truly am a really passionate person about this city. I love this place and I can't wait to watch it grow. And I hope that I get to be part of the voice and part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. <clears throat> Ms. Nelson. Uh, Adam Tegelden, followed by Trey Hansen. <coughs> I got a little bit of a cold, so I apologize. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I'm very excited uh, for a chance to give back to my community. I've always been an entrepreneur. I started uh, being an entrepreneur when I was 12 years old with a candy cart over in Cottonwood Heights, and I became the most successful business in my honors uh, classes. Um, that came to a failure when I didn't realize that chocolate ice cream melted in the uh, garage when the heat, when it got hot outside. Uh, but I learned that mistake and I uh, returned to business when I was 19. I discovered marketing and promotional items and t-shirts and I did different things like that, ad specialties for different businesses, uh, radio stations and just any business that would purchase it. Um, I also became a marketing and business consultant from all this experience and I started traveling the nation and uh, teaching people how to start their own businesses from the experience I had at a young age. And I would give them a, a little seminar and we'd just, uh, I'd teach them, we'd go out to, the, to different uh, doctors and teach them how to actually get clients what it would take. Um, then I started doing a supplement company in uh, 2007 uh, named Alter Perform. Uh, started very small and I worked it to 300 stores and we got up to 50,000 in sales a month. Um, through all this I became a motivator in life and business coach. Uh, giving people, constantly outwitting their human constraints, empowering themselves and 
just being motivational. I've done over a thousand videos on Facebook and YouTube, uh, motivational health based uh, videos. I've got a show called Passion Living with Adam, which is about uh, taking on your passions, living your life passionately, and being healthy. Uh, there's, I also have a podcast called Alter Perform, uh, which we talk about. We talk with business professionals and people in life that are doing things to perform your best in business and life. Um, we, I also completed a, uh, a documentary with my, about my parents. They got sick a couple of years ago and I had to basically put most of that aside and take care of them. So we did a documentary about their struggle going through their health problems, Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, many heart problems and diabetes. And we've been in the hospital many times since then. Uh, some of the things, I've, I've lived in the city for about 12 years uh, and I've been, uh, what I've noticed, some of the things in the area, I, I'd be, it'd be naive for me to actually say that I know all the problems because I'm not on the city council, I'm not ingrained in everything, seeing what the problems are coming up all the time, but some of the things I've seen is air quality and affordable housing and um, the infrastructure, the transit in, in infrastructure. I've, I've personally experienced the problems with air quality because I have asthma and I run, I hike and run up in the, up on Bonneville shoreline, up City Creek Canyon, and I've noticed the differences when the air quality is very heavy or when it's very light. And I want, would want to see what things we could address to rectify that as a city. Also, the uh, affordable housing and um, the existing transit and transportation because I have noticed that although all the things have been great for pedestrians, the little scooters we have, the bicycles, everything that we've done, I've noticed things have actually become a bit more congested. Um, one of the things I would bring besides uh, not just addressing things with a budget, but trying to, working on getting the community as a whole together to work on challenges and problems that we could actually do to overcome whatever that comes up uh, and everyone be treated equally. One of the experiences I had with my father this couple of years is that he was on a feed tube and I had my doctors telling me he was gonna die as soon as they took out the feed tube in a week or two. Um, so every day I had to coach him to work with a speech therapist. Every day I had to talk to him about if he wanted to live or die. He wanted to live. Um, a week or two, they took the feed tube out and he lived, he's still alive today and well. Uh, I've got him on organic foods, healthy, but that kind of commitment and that kind of dedication is what I'd want to bring to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tegeldon. Uh, Trey Hansen. Followed by Dennis Hanks. Council members, thank you very much for your time and consideration today. David, it's great to see you as well. Uh, before I begin, I would like to just congratulate every applicant here um, for stepping up in the interest of public service. <laughs> I think it's fair to say District 4 is in good hands. Um, I've provided you pages and pages of information on my thoughts uh, about issues facing the city, so I'd like to take things in a slightly different direction. I'd like to begin with a quote by George MacDonald, who's a Scottish author, and this quote really resonates with me. He stated, when we are out of sympathy with the young, then I think our work in this world is over. When I look at the general state of affairs locally, nationally, and globally, it appears to me that sympathy for the young is being all but depleted. If we choose to ignore our nation's ballooning student debt crisis, policies adversely affecting the environment and imbalanced, rep imbalanced representation in Congress, state houses, and even local bodies, we find that young people still face challenges here at home. We have all at one point or, no one point or another read a headline claiming that millennials are responsible for the death of such and such industry, or a headline suggesting the ineptitude of an entire generation. I believe these messages are harmful and it is showing. Recently, I saw a job posting listed on, listed on Indeed that was circulating the net. An unnamed company in Park City was looking for an experienced executive assistant to assist a member of their leadership team. At the bottom of the job posting, in all caps read, Millennials need not apply. 
Forgiving for a moment that the eldest millennials are 38 years of age and possess plenty of work experience to ser serve and succeed in any capacity, I ask what warrants such discrimination in private and public sectors? District 4 is a millennials district. The majority of residents are below the age of 34, with 25% of working adults between the ages of 18 and 24. We are well educated, but we're typically lower to middle income. The most recent district specific data from the past census shows that 80% of household units in the district are renter occupied. And when you pair this with the knowledge that the median household income citywide is below national averages, it paints a picture of someone like me. I forfeited a high paying opportunity at Goldman Sachs to pursue a career bettering my community in some variation of public service. I have served as a lobbyist on behalf of municipalities, law enforcement associations and others. I am the youngest full time staffer in the office of the governor and have been since I was hired on the governor's communication staff at the age of 21. I am the youngest member of Westminster College's alumni board. And I rent a one bedroom apartment with leaky sinks, sporadic mold issues and a plethora of other issues. I'm a first generation college graduate, the child of a blue collar worker, I have thousands of dollars of student debt, and regularly experience the effects of rent increases. On the other hand, I also have the privilege of briefing the governor on communication matters, assisting on policy initiatives like the investment of $100 million in bettering air quality along the Wasatch Front, the process of a $19 billion budget rollout, ceremonial tasks like welcoming Vice President Biden to Utah, and others. Young people in this district and in this city are achieving incredible feats. They bring tremendous life and energy to Salt Lake and they're being priced out of home ownership and even the ability to afford rent. Many are violating their leases because packing more people into a home or apartment is the only way to afford to live here. Gentrification is alive and well and it isn't the only issue facing this city and this district. And while all of these, while all of these issues aren't strictly unique to younger populations, they are more consequential for this demographic. This is just one reason why I have applied to fill this vacancy. I believe that I bring unique experiences and expertise to the table. I also believe that I am representative of the average District 4 resident. In my years of experience working with and interacting with elected office holders, I have found that virtually none of them are renters. I believe that this body could benefit from the perspectives provided by one, especially considering they would be representative of the vast majority of the district. I'm also applying to fill this vacancy because I believe in the power of incumbency and I believe that the voters should decide their representation in the upcoming election without having to consider who the council's appointment was. That person would undeniably receive a leg up in the election. That is why I, recuse, I will recuse myself from running in the upcoming election and I believe that the residents of the district would be grateful for the chance to more fairly elect a candidate they deem fit um, based on the candidate's merit. I would consider it a tremendous honor to serve alongside each of you and to represent District 4. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Uh, Dennis Hanks, followed by uh, Thomas Green. Good afternoon. This will be short and sweet. Uh, this is my oh. elevator speech. I'll rely on the, uh, the application, the questionnaire for any details. Uh, Dennis Hanks, I'm a retired civil engineer. I live over in the Gateway. And the three things that I'm particularly interested in are uh, affordable housing, mass transit, and making the downtown more pedestrian friendly. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanks. Uh, Thomas Green? Is Mr. Green here? I have not seen him. Okay, I'll put, it. put his name aside. We'll come back to him. Um, Bernie Hart, followed by Igor Leminsky. I feel out of place. There's so many young people here. <laughs> Great young people, cool. I like to see them here. It's really, really, it, it makes me feel good about the whole process. We need it. We need it badly. Um, I'm here for a couple of reasons. Um, and listening to the young people speak today, if you ever put me on the council, you'd mess up my life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I 
have so much positive things going on and working in the community with the homeless community. We, we had a discussion this morning with somebody that has the connections to really start looking at teen suicide in a, a different way. I've met with city prosecutors last week, and uh, uh, I, there's just so much stuff going on that that I didn't, uh, I, I had my questions about the representation in, in the district before, because I don't think there was enough uh, attention by our representatives to the homeless community. I thought it was being ignored. And that is one of the reasons I, I developed somewhat of an attitude. And I do have an attitude. And you probably do need an ordinary old man sitting up there with you once in a while to <laughs> And I'd love to serve that role, but you get some great young people here applying. And you know, everybody knows, I've been at the microphone here enough times, that my concerns are homelessness. And I would ask whoever you appoint to really start paying attention to the process of the transition from the road home to the new, uh, new shelters, because there's a lot of doubts. There's a lot of doubts, even from the people that are leading ch this effort. There's no guarantees they're going to work. I was just asked this morning by somebody to, to take our program to Washington, D.C., because the population, uh, the, the problem there is out of sight. People are coming in from Seattle and other places to look at the problem here in Salt Lake City. And it's not the only problem we're dealing with, but it's one of the major ones that's going to impact everything everybody else talked about, affordable housing, uh, everything, the, the quality of life, uh, the walkability of downtown. I just came over here, and on my way over, I walked. There, this, uh, I, I almost fell on my, I don't know, who's the sidewalk guy? Uh, <laughs> I, I almost fell down a half a dozen times because the sidewalks aren't shoveled, so you can't walk around the city. But those are smaller things, but that can be taken care of and addressed. But the problems really are people problems. All the problems are people problems. And they've been forever problems. They're not new. They're not different. Every city council, every state, every government body is dealing with the same policy. And what I would ask from the people, anybody you appoint, that they start looking for innovative and creative ideas, something different. Because the old solutions just haven't got it. And especially with the changes in the environment and the pressures that are being put on our limited resources, it's going to take new thinking. And I hope the young people can get out of the boxes that even I hear that some of them are in and look for new ways to solve some of these problems and bring ideas to the council and work together with the council to find new solutions would be just really special. Um, I think I said everything I wanted to say. But uh, to anybody that spoke here today that doesn't get an appointment, I'll give you my phone number. We'll organize. We can make changes in our city without sitting in that seat. And it's just by working hard and getting things done that that can happen. So I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Uh, Igor Leminski, followed by Leah Rogers. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Um, thank you so much to the council for your marathon of attention. This is uh, really impressive and I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to the fellow applicants uh, in District 4. It kind of reminds me why I love District 4 so much. Um, so I'm here today to ask to be a member of this council and a representative of District 4 because of my experience doing grassroots organizing and civic engagement. Uh, I truly believe that that is what we need most to address the issues that we are facing. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, I've worked at nonprofits, I've worked on political campaigns, and my job has been how do I get the people who are most affected by the issues to be participating in the solutions? And I strongly believe that the only way we can actually address our problems is just that way. Uh, I think we've all seen on homelessness, uh, too many neighborhoods say they don't want it in their own backyard because either they don't feel like they're part of the process or they don't feel like it's their issue. It's an issue that's happening to neighborhoods over so it doesn't, doesn't affect them. Uh, on air quality, I think we've seen that the number one contributor to pollution is driver behavior in public transport. Uh, and we can't solve that issue unless the drivers themselves are getting out of their cars, taking public transport, and we have public transport options that are available to them. I think the reason I believe in 
collaborative engagement is because it's changed my life fundamentally. Uh, I grew up here uh, in Holiday. Uh, my mom's a refugee. She came to this country from Egypt. She raised three kids on her own. Uh, and, you know, like many kids growing up below the poverty line, I went to 10 schools in 12 grades. Uh, and in my current work with the United Way of Salt Lake, I work with refugees and migrant populations to get parents involved in the school district and get them involved in early education um, to make sure their kids are on track for kindergarten. The reason I feel qualified to do that is not only because of my experience grassroots organizing, is that the experience I had growing up helps me understand uh, what these parents are going through uh, and the problems that contribute um, to their lack of participation and the challenges they have um, with making sure their kids are on grade level. I fundamentally believe that there's no replacement for expertise of experience. Uh, there are some amazing candidates here um, who have some wonderful degrees. Uh, I truly feel that my experience growing up in this city uh, the experience I have with our refugee and migrant communities um, make me uniquely qualified for this. And what I'd like to do if I am elected into this, if I am appointed into this position, is making sure that the folks who are experiencing uh, directly the issues of homelessness and affordable housing have a place where they can organize, collaborate, and share their voice. Uh, with this council and be in the center of the decision-making process. Uh, I believe that not only creates a sense of self-efficacy in our community um, and a sense of shared value, but it's also the only way that we can actually address the issues that we're facing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leminski. Uh, Leo Rogers. And then after Leo uh, is uh, Numeriano Rio Domingo here. Okay, how about uh, Thomas Green? Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Rogers, it looks like you are our final speaker. Well, thanks for saving the best for last. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> I want to start by thanking you all for putting this together. I'm sure it's quite a daunting task with 21 of us. That being said, I come to you today as plain as I am. I don't have the backing of dozens of people throughout the city and a laundry list of endorsements. I don't have a former campaign. I've never run for really much of anything before this. I'm just me. Someone who moved out of the backwater they grew up in to a city where they'd hoped they'd find belonging, and indeed did. Someone who considers themselves an urbanist. Someone who has lived with a lot of the issues that we see as problems throughout the city. When we talk about the housing crisis, I've felt it. I spend far too much of my paycheck to live in a small apartment in Trolley Square, <coughs> solely because it's the best place in the area. When we talk about making the city more inviting to those who wish to move here, I know how to do that. When I decided to pack up my life and move out here, there were a dozen other choices that were cheaper or closer or places that my other friends were moving to. No other city could lay claim to the enjoyable environment that Salt Lake City has created, however. That's why I wanted to get into this race, because as much as I enjoy living in Salt Lake, I know there's a lot of those who don't. The west side of the city routinely gets pushed aside in favor of the east side. We must do better. Women in the city are still not paid an equal wage to their male counterparts. We must do better. Salt Lake is one of the worst cities in the country for missing and murdered indigenous women. We must do better. Homelessness is still so prevalent and resources so sparse. We must do better. With the Olympics potentially coming back to our lovely city, we must start preparing for it. We need to assure that any infrastructure we build to accommodate the Olympics can also be used to enrich our communities once the Olympics are gone. We must also strive to carve out a progressive path as an example of leadership, not only to other cities in Utah, but to every city in the Mountain West. With a good enough vision and a die-hard dedication, Salt Lake City could become the epicenter of culture in the Mountain West. However, that means we must sort our current problems while we carve that path. That means things as simple as more bike lanes to encourage people to bike to work and curb their emissions, to more complex solutions like safe injection sites. We are Salt Lake City, seen as a progressive stronghold in a vast expanse of stagnation. To achieve these goals, we are going to need a strong urbanist to represent this district, someone who is willing to dedicate every second of their free time to knocking every door in this district and talking to those most affected by our policy, someone who is aware of what it is like to be in their shoes. We cannot seek to fix the housing crisis if we ourselves have never experienced it. We cannot make Salt Lake City more inviting if we've never lived outside of it. We cannot make the city more welcoming to marginalized groups if we do not belong to them. That's why you need me. 
someone who day one would commit to talking to every single person in this district regardless of whether they are a voter or even have a door to knock on. Someone who overpays for an apartment because there are no other options in the part of the city they live in. Someone who saw Salt Lake on a map and researched it and fell in love. Someone who belongs to a marginalized group. And as a member of the queer community, that's me. I am all of those. I am far more representative of this district than anyone else in the room at the moment. Ultimately, that's what makes me the best choice, I think. It's simply that I care. I'm not here because I've always dreamed of politics while binge watching the West Wing. I'm not here because it's the first step on a 20 year plan that sees me become the governor or run for Congress. I'm here because I love this city with all of my heart. I'm here because I want to make it this as an amazing experience as we can for everyone that lives here. I'm here because I care about the quality of those in uh, the quality of life of those in my community. I care about how we govern. We must consider the full impact of every action or inaction of this body. We must look especially at the impacts of those who do not write checks to campaigns. We must fight for the people of color who live in the city and often leave poor lives solely because of what part of the city they live in or what their skin color is. I may not come here before you with much more than a vision and dedication, but it's a vision that groups like the Green Party of Utah and the League of Native American Voters believe in, and a dedication that many of the people I have talked to are willing to sign on for. We can truly make this city a force of goodwill, not just in Utah or in the Mountain West, but in the whole country. Salt Lake can make national headlines, not for its terrible air quality or questionable legislature, but for amazing things, for being the most inclusive city in the country, for being the best place to live, and for carving that blazing path of progressive ideas that will see this city prosper and its people thrive no matter what walk of life they come from. I sincerely hope to leave here tonight as the person you've chosen to help carve that path and to represent the wonderful people I call my neighbors and place I call home. I thank you once again for taking the time to put all this together and for letting me speak before you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, and uh, that, those are our candidates uh, that we have. So thank you all uh, very much. Uh, so the next steps will be uh, as follows. So we do have uh, lunch uh, provided for all of you. Uh, so we will, and we'll open the back door here. Um, so the lunch will be set up in the historic room. Uh, feel free to grab a plate and then move into uh, the reception area in the council office or the hallway, um, since there are so many, uh, that might be easier. Uh, but you know, grab some food, uh, enjoy yourselves. Uh, council, let's reconvene um, at, let's reconvene at 6.30. Um, to go through the, um, well, okay, here's the thing. So we can, <laughs> well, no, the formal meeting is at seven, so it depends on how, how much time uh, we want. No, we're voting, we're voting before then. So if, if you want to have a longer break now where we can you know, talk to uh, some of the applicants, uh, over lunch and then uh, have some time to think uh, for us, then I was thinking 6.30 would give us you know, almost two hours to, to do that. Um, I don't think that the sorting is going to take uh, a lot of time since we'll just go through and uh, do it electronically. That will be, that's why we have the uh, monitor in here. So we could do that or we could have a short break, come back, finish early and then take another break and then have to come back for the formal meeting. It seems to make more sense to, you know, go from the formal or the work session into the formal meeting. So council member, uh, Johnston, I uh, just want to make sure we don't press ourselves for too much time at 630, 615 or somewhere in there might be a little safer. Uh, I'm fine with 615 too. Um, council chair. Yes. Cindy. And, uh, Oh, Yes. <laughs> Even luckier. Okay. Um, <laughs> to the extent the council is trying to decide how much time it sounds like you would like individually to think through yes. the fabulous presentations you've just heard, that's of course in your court. I just want to remind you that the interviews are to take place publicly. And so while you may want to have a quick social moment and thank them for their applications, the interview process is the public Correct. process. Correct. Thank you.
So there's that, no that is Margaret. For, for those of you who don't know Margaret, Margaret Plain is the city attorney and she keeps us all out of trouble. So Margaret, thank you for that. Um, any other uh, comments or thoughts before we uh, break and so no reconvene mingling. at 615? Sorry? No mingling. No mingling. Well, mingling only. Mingling, mingling is fine, I think, but, um, but thorough, thorough discuss, policy discussions okay. uh, probably shy away from it. Okay, great. Thank you all. We are now reconvened as, as the Salt Lake City Council in our work session. Um, <clears throat> so prior to the break, we heard from all of the applicants uh, for District 4. And you know, I, I quickly went over what the what the next steps are going to be, uh, but I'll I'll reiterate those now. So, um, in front of us, or not in front of us yet, but I'm holding uh, ballots that that each of us will have. Uh, I have a, n a number of rounds depending on how uh, how far um, things will go and where that sorting process then takes us. Uh, each council member. Uh, we'll have up to four votes. Um, they're not going to be um, ranked in any certain way, um, just you know, one vote per person, um, but each gets four. Uh, upon completion of our ballots, we will hand those back to uh, our executive, oh, to uh, Cindy Liu, uh, and the ballots will then be tabulated and we'll, uh, be registered live on the monitor. Council members, do you have, or does anyone have any questions or comments prior to us uh, going through this sorting? Mr. Chair? Council member Johnson. So after the, the votes are tallied, we'll have a discussion about next steps at that point? Yeah, so okay. you know, what we've, what we've done is, so according to the state statute, we, uh, the, the council uh, can there, there's two different options that are open to us um, that we've talked about that fit within the statute. Uh, the first thing is, uh, depending on, on how the, the sorting takes place and the numbers that happen, uh, up to four um, individuals would, would move forward uh, to potentially be uh, re-interviewed or go through another process at our council meeting next week. So that would be one option. The other option, uh, would be depending on the uh, sorting tally. Um, we could also act tonight. We've reserved, uh, we've reserved that right. This uh, statute allows uh, for a decision to be made tonight. Uh, what we want to ensure though is that uh, as, we, as we discuss this, as we make a decision, um, that we do so uh, in a way that uh, the six of us on the council uh, are comfortable with. Um, and before we move forward. Does that make sense? Okay, other questions or comments? Okay, um, I will pass these uh, ballots down to each of you and then when we're done, uh, we'll just, Cindy Lou will, will gather those. They have our names now. Oh, they have the names? Yeah, here's Amy's, this is James's. Okay. Can I have James's? Can I have yes. You can have this one. You can have the other two rounds. You can be me. Okay. So while the votes are being tabulated, does anyone want to tell a joke? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not very funny, so I'm, I, and I'm, and I'm not gonna call another break. We've had far more breaks. Um, if you haven't followed city council meetings, I'm always, um, people are always complaining that when I chair, I don't call enough breaks. And today, because it's you, you're the one that always is complaining to me. 
So today, I think we've made up for any breaks that I have tried to blown through, blow through in any meeting. For the uh, we've year, had, we've had more for the uh, year than enough. Yes, well, for and previously too. Correct. We'll see. We will see. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, You're him in. <laughs> to ensure the votes are part of the public record, uh, uh, yes. Cindy Mansell is going to read the tallies here. Well, okay. Who does it on the screen? Wonderful. Okay, Cindy. Cindy Mansell is our city recorder. Will Hi, you Cindy. will you speak Hi. loudly, Cindy? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Councilmember Charlie Luke voted for Jen Colby, Kyle Deans, Ryan James Parker, and Analia Valdemoros. Sorry. And Councilmember Aaron Mendenhall voted for Michael Iverson, Brianne Miller, Ryan James Parker, and Analia Valde Valdemoros. Councilmember Amy Fowler voted for Brianne Miller, Renya Nelson, Ryan James Parker, and An Analia Valdemoros. Councilmember James Rogers voted for Brianne Miller, Miles Petty, Katie Sign, and Analia Valdemoros. Councilmember Andrew Johnston voted for Michael Iverson, Brianne Miller, Ryan James Parker, and Analia Valdemoros. Councilmember Chris Wharton voted for Jen Colby, Michael Iverson, Brianne Miller, and Analia Valdemoros. I went too fast. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, so since the screen's not updating um, and the counts, so even though the, t the votes have been read, um, staff are tallying them right now. Um, so I guess, the, you know, the discussion for us as a council is where we go from here, um, what the, you know, what, what the ideas are for uh, the decision that we make tonight, whether we um, a, just narrow uh, the, the field to four, or up to four, uh, or uh, whether we, based on, on whatever the numbers are, that we make a decision tonight. I think, uh, Council Mr. Member Chair, Fowler. I'm sorry. Um, can we wait to have that discussion until we get sure. the tallies just so that... I was hoping, I was hoping that, that yeah. that would be done by the time I was done filibustering. We had... but. Such a good system. Well, you can still yes. filibuster. I can still, I, I know, but I won't. <laughs> I can put back on ECDC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we know. Could we um, just ask staff to read it? Okay. While the uh, tallying is being done, I, I can't see the screen, so I don't know if anything is, if that's working at all. Um, okay, but what I, what I do want to um, do is to thank everybody who put your name forward. Um, even though, you know, this is not a, a traditional process where uh, you, you sign up to, to run, but then you, you know, move forward and, and have to campaign, uh, you're still putting yourselves out there. Um, and so every single one of you, I want to thank you for, uh, for the time and effort that you have spent.
Okay, so it looks like the board is, is up right now. So the top four um, votes, uh, the first is for Analia Valdemoros with six, Brianne Miller with five, Ryan Parker with four, and Michael Iverson with three. So if we, if we did decide tonight to um, extend until next week uh, before we make a decision, those would be the top vote getters, Analia Valdemoros, Brianne Miller, Ryan Parker, and Michael Iverson. The other option would be to, if, if the council feels that, um, that we are ready uh, to make a decision, that decision could be uh, made via a motion tonight as well. What's the will of the council body? Mr. Chair. Council Member Johnston. Uh, I'm, I'm all for the process we talked about. I think we wanted at least four um, votes for somebody to move on. Is that accurate? That is, that is what we had talked about last week. Um, in which case, instead of three moving forward, there would be four. Maybe three. Um, instead, of three. Or instead of four, there would be three. Um, because uh, Anna has six, Brianne has five, and Ryan has four. Sure. Um, in lieu, the other thing that strikes to me is that um, Anna Valdemoros got one from everybody on this, on this council at this point. So that seems to be a, a consensus of sorts. Um, I point that out just to say that it seems like there's a, something there, so. Mr. Chair, I- Council Member <clears throat> Wharton. Um, I think that um, for, for me it was, you know, difficult just getting through um, to these top three or four. Um, I would be in favor of more time. Um, I, I understand if the body wants to move forward based on um, what council member um, Johnson just said, but um, I would be in favor of um, giving us another week to see if, if anything else, um, see if it, just to have another week to deliberate. Okay, what I can do um, on that, um, Let's, do you want to propose that as a straw poll? Council Member Wharton. Um, sure, I move that we. Um, Could we discuss it first? Oh, uh, sorry. Sure. Make sure everything out. Does anybody else have anything? Any other discussion? Yeah, I'll chime in. Okay. I, I think, Hall. I see, um, I see both points that we, that uh, Ms. Valdemaros had a vote from every one of us and that, that's pretty hard to do on any issue, not to mention a candidate for our body. Um, and I, I do, on the one hand, feel like we have, we could have a week to dig deeper into questioning with the three or four candidates that, that rose to the top in this discussion. On the other hand, I think we asked them for a lot of information and positions already, and they hustled to get those uh, responses back to us. and in. Um, in many ways, I think we, we've already spoken from our votes tonight. So I'm also concerned about um, just access to the conversations that, um, that there are three of us traveling on city business tomorrow through, um, through Friday for me anyway, and I'm not sure about you too. So I, I don't, I'm not very available and I'm not sure how much access mm -hmm. I would have to um, be able to further these conversations face to face anyway. So I, I, I'm not making a decision. Okay, Councilmember Fowler. Well, um, I'm, this is sort of one of those things when we, this, is, this whole process has been new for all of us and something that we've all tried to really work through. And I mean, every single one of these candidates were unbelievable and this was such a difficult decision. Um, that being said, you know, I know that we all really walked through the process thoughtfully and carefully and listened today and made some, some really hard decisions. So I'm kind of with Aaron on this in the sense that, you know, 
I, I don't know how much more information I can get out of these top three. Um, and I don't know how much I will be available. I'm traveling with, with um, Aaron. And my, I'm on the fence on this. I, I, there seems to be a consensus of six votes, but I can understand people needing more time and maybe wanting to reach out more. So again, I'm not making a decision either. I, I do know <laughs> this is great. This is how usually our, our when you make a motion, go. we'll vote. Okay. <laughs> right. Just but I do want to say I, I know that we've all been very thoughtful about <laughs> reviewing everything and trying to be open to every one of these candidates. And it was so wonderful listening to each of you today and made that deliberation for me even harder and 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 that's an honor and I'm grateful for that being difficult um, that's what this is about but I, I don't know if that I can learn much more and I don't know that people want to go through much more of this either so I, I can see both sides of of the argument there okay. politicians you, Council Member, Council Member come Rogers. on <laughs> I'm comfortable moving forward tonight uh, Mr. Chair I've I know Brianne Miller I know Anna met with uh, Mr. Parker several times. Um, you know, I think that Bernard Hart said it well. You know, this is not the end for most of these people in this room, and we're going to see a lot more of them moving forward. So I, I, uh, I'm comfortable with that. I, I felt like we've done a good process. We've had great questions, good dialogue. Um, so I just I think it's, it's time to fill that seat. Okay. Councilmember Johnston. Any thoughts? As everyone's on the fence, how about this? I think a good decision now will be a good decision a week from now. Um, I'm comfortable with that. So I'd be okay going through another week process. I think we need to talk about what the process would be and why it would give more information for us to make a more informed decision. Um, but I would be okay with going forward with the top three since they all have four votes, um, identifying what we would need in the next week, um, a short of individual meetings because we can't do that across the board and uh, then plan on next Tuesday making a, a motion. I'd be okay with that. Okay, so that sounds similar to the straw poll that Council Member Wharton was uh, going to make. <laughs> Do you want to make that? You don't need to make it in motion form because we're just in the work session. Yeah, I, my straw poll would be that we, um, that we delay this until our next meeting, um, that we um, firm up what process it's going to look like as quickly as possible, um, both for our benefit and the uh, benefit of the applicants. And then we have our final vote um, at the next meeting. Okay. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Do you all know what you're voting on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thumbs up that you support the straw poll. Thumbs down. Oh, wait, the, I'm sorry. Wait. Thumbs up that you support the straw poll, which means that you want to delay the process, or not delay it, but extend the process for another week uh, for the top those top three. Did, um, that was my question. A mm -hmm. Thumbs down would be oh, that yeah. you don't support, um, the, the, or that you would you would rather vote tonight. But you, you posed it, so it's a lose lose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, we're, everyone wants to say that they've done a, a good, thorough process, right? And I feel like we've done that. Uh, not to debate or, or bicker back and forth, but you know, this is just another week for these candidates to stir and, and move on, you know, worry about what's going on. I, I am confident in our votes. Look, we've, we've laid it all out. We've got the top three, and I think if we were to vote again, I think that it'd still end up the way it is. So. Okay. So you're going to vote no. So we have a straw I, I mean, it, so it, it sounds horrible poll. to say that you're going to vote no on, on this, but yeah, I am going to vote no on it. Okay. I'm with you, man. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, so thumbs up uh, to vote for the straw poll, thumbs down to vote against it. <laughs> it's up, it's up. It's hard when there's six of us. All right, know? she doesn't know. She doesn't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, the reality is. Thumbs up, thumbs up that you support the straw poll, uh, thumbs down that you uh, oppose it. Okay, so okay. that straw poll fails. Um, uh, two voted for Councilmember Wharton, Councilmember Johnston, Councilmember Rogers, Mendenhall, uh, Fowler, and Luke voted no. Okay. Mr. Chair, then I'd make a motion. 
Okay. <laughs> Based on the order. results of uh, this, um, our polling wait, tonight. Wait, wait, hold on. Hold on. Wait. We're not in formal. Oh, oh we can't. We can't do. We can't do. Formal. We can't do a formal. Yeah. But so you can do a straw poll. A straw poll. Yeah. Yes. Not a motion. Do a straw poll to get the feeling of your colleagues. Sure. That's Mr. Work Chair. Session practice. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'd like to propose a straw poll. Uh, that we would, uh, during our formal session, uh, appoint Analia Valdemoros to fill the vacant uh, District 4 position for the remainder of uh, this term. Tonight. Okay. Tonight. Is everyone clear on Is that, that straw poll? I want to check in with Margaret. You can do it here by straw poll, and then in formal meeting, um, you'll need to formalize it. There's a resolution that's waiting for you. but. Um, Again, it's your council practice to do straw polls in work session yeah. and then formalize things during the formal meeting, and we've got a resolution prepared if you'd like it tonight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is, is, is everyone clear on, and, on Andrew's straw poll? Okay. Do you want to restate it one more time? Uh, I'd like to straw poll uh, appointing Anna Valdemoros tonight during our formal session as to fill the vacancy in District 4 for this term. Okay. Uh, th thumbs up that you support, thumbs down that you oppose. All right, so that is unanimous. All six council members uh, voting uh, to uh, recommend the appointment of Annalia uh, Valdemoros uh, for Council District 4. That would be done during our formal meeting. Uh, so a um, Again, thank you all, uh, candidates, for running. Um, Analia, congratulations. Uh, an informal congratulations, a work session congratulations. Um, and then uh, that uh, appointment would be uh, made during the formal meeting tonight. So Council Member Fowler has requested another break. Um, between, but before our formal meeting, uh, which, which would be in order. Um, does anybody else have any items of business during the work session that we still need to complete? I'll look to our executive director. There's one quick announcement, if I may. Not trying Please. to nose into your break, but um, just uh, the Mill Creek City Council will be holding a hearing on their general plan, and the council chair uh, would like to go to that meeting. It's next Monday at 7 p.m. I'd like to take a letter from the City Council expressing the Council's previously discussed concern about the idea of Mill Creek uh, having on its future planning map part of Salt Lake City's jurisdiction. So that um, we'll circulate a draft letter, but the council chair wanted to check in with the council on the idea of, of physically going there and um, presenting a letter and then also invite all council members to attend that public meeting uh, Monday the 28th at 7 p.m. I, I have you. a really quick question on that. If more than us all go? You're fine because it's you're attending a public meeting. Okay. Even if I say something about what's being yes. said, okay. Sure. You, you're as any citizen, you can address them, right? Okay. Great. If there are no other items, uh, we are adjourned until seven o'clock, where we will reconvene as the formal. <laughs>